there are two presentations or two speakers have not been able to join us this afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, and that is Professor Usman Khan from Senegal and Professor Ilolov. Ilolov, we've managed to remove that, but uh, uh, our friend Dr. Usman Khan from Senegal, the role of Academies of Science in bridging political, cultural, and religious divides, the views of ANSTS. Uh, th that is, uh, the speaker is not here. The rest are here, the rest are here yes. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This session is about academies of sciences and arts and letters. Uh, the title of the conference, as you know, is Bridging the Divides through science and technology between East and West. Uh, the IAS feels that academies of sciences and letters have a role to play in this, and this is why we hope that this session will be interactive. We will draw up a roadmap for academies of sciences and letters for the future so that uh, we go back to our countries with uh, a clearer vision as to what is the role that science academies and academies of letters can do to bridge political divides and other divides. Uh, I'll hand you over to uh, Professor Zakri Abdul Hamid, fellow of the Islamic World Academy of Sciences and advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia on science and technology and his co-chair, very familiar face, uh, Professor Mohammed Hassan, founding director general or executive director of TWAS, president of the African Academy of Sciences, and a whole host of other academies as well to take us through the next three hours. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you, uh, Brother Munif. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, let me welcome you to the uh, session five of this uh, Congress. And in fact, uh, this is a very important session because it really uh, uh, is about uh, the theme of our two-day meeting in uh, Doha, uh, the Islamic world and the West. And uh, today's slate uh, is very impressive enough we have representatives from a number of uh, eminent uh, academies from the West in the first uh, session of our session this afternoon. Uh, what I'd like to uh, appeal to the speakers, if they can uh, uh, sort of present and summarize their talk to a maximum of 15 minutes or less, uh, so that we would have time for my uh, discussion. In fact, the most important person here is Professor Muhammad Hassan. I'm just the timekeeper, Muhammad. Uh, he'll, be giving, he'll be giving the critique of all the presentation. I also hope that uh, we could have some time for uh, discussion from the floor. I think you will have a lot of things to say about uh, bridging the gap between the West and the uh, Islamic uh, countries. So, uh, without uh, further ado, let me invite our uh, first speaker, Professor Peter Drain, the Honorary President of Alie, uh, based in the Netherlands, and he'll be speaking on bridging the political, cultural, and religious divides the role of academies of sciences and humanities. Uh, as you all are very familiar, uh, the biodata uh, described in the program book. So, uh, Peter, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me begin by, by saying that I'm a bit confused. I, at first, I have written a paper uh, of about, for about uh, a little over an hour and discussing with uh, the, the organizers of this conference 
uh, I agreed with uh, reducing that to a presentation of half an hour. And now all of a sudden, this has been reduced to a quarter of an hour. My, uh, say my belief is that you never should change the rules while we are playing. And uh, I came here with, now with this half an hour presentation. And uh, I think I take the liberty to present what I have prepared in this. I, th I think you just go ahead. Yeah, try after, after all, this is the key. All right, speaker, no right? problem. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, couple, a couple of copies of my paper with me, so anyone who, who would like to pick it up, uh, uh, welcome to have it afterwards. Uh, and if don't, I don't have enough, just give me your card and I will send you uh, by email this paper. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Chairman, the fourth objective of this 18th conference was formulated as uh, to err the views of scientists and academicians on ways to bridge the divide between the Islamic world and the West. It's a great honor for me to be invited to contribute to this dialogue uh, and to present my view on possible ways to meet this challenge. My view will be defective since I cannot claim great expertise on Islamic academic thought, although I did try uh, to acquire some insight by reading uh, relevant liter literature, but I do apologize for possible misunderstanding. The um, Objective continues with, and the particular role that academies of science can play, play in such an endeavor. Here I feel a bit more at home. During my pres presidency of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences, and especially as president of the European Federation of National Academies, I regularly engaged to reflect on the core functions of academies and their role in building a platform for understanding. There is a third element, emphasizing rebuilding bridges through science and technology, suggesting that these bridges have existed in the past and merely have to be revitalized. For anyone who takes cognizance of the history of science, this is indeed a correct observation. As, has, as we had heard uh, today and yesterday in previous uh, speeches. It's a fundamental error to classify medieval Europe and medieval Islam as two separate worlds. See the powerful presence of Islam in medieval Spain and the late medieval Balkans. The Renaissance in Europe owes much to Muslim and Arab science. Quite a number of classical texts of Greek scientists had been translated into Arabic and were thus saved for later generations. Later in the 11th century, Muslim scientists in Al-Andalus elaborated and translated Arabic texts into Latin, transmitting to Christian Europe a wealth of scientific knowledge. What is probably the most, wait a minute, not yet. What is probably the most uh, important uh, in this contribution is the early calling to rely on experimental and empirical evidence and rejecting the uncritical, uncritical acceptance of authorities. That really was innovative and later it became the basis for science. In the course of the time, however, the influential position of Muslim science has dramatically declined. As Professor Badran said this morning, scientific values have lost a bit of their power or maybe much of their power in the Muslim world. And today, too few universities 
in that world are any longer centers of excellence in research, as the Shanghai or the Times Higher ranking uh, show. Scientific achievement as measured by international quality criteria are scanned and despite occasional and isolated highlights, in many countries the number of scientists and engineers that are active in research is precariously low. Fortunately, there are positive signs. We have heard excellent papers during this conference. We have heard excellent initiatives in Malaysia, Pakistan and Turkey, for instance. The 2010 UNDP Human Development Index shows a number of Arab countries uh, showing a fast moving upwards the ladder. The UNDP strategy promotes inclusive growth, job creation and human development. GIST initiated a number of interested, interesting US-backed projects. The Royal Society started a project, Atlas of the Islamic World, Science and Innovation, showing uh, some uh, real progress. Optimism and hope were also expressed by Barack Obama in his well-known speech at the University of Cairo, promising support and cooperation in medical, scientific and technological development in Muslim majority countries. Moreover, in the Arab region, the, the Arab region is experiencing a defining moment in modern history, with millions of particularly younger women and men uh, calling for change and demanding a greater say in decisions that affect their lives and a more transparent and accountable governance. This is an advantage circumstance since there is a clear positive correlation between human development index and the quality of democracy in a country. This is the same uh, statement uh, actually uh, that Professor Badran uh, said this morning with respect to uh, human rights. These are hopeful signs of progress, but data uh, in general uh, picture uh, too little progress uh, and the, the progress in science and technology leaves much to be desired. We conclude that there is a need for rebuilding bridges between Muslim and Western science. What can academies of science and humanities do to contribute to this process? It's clear that the world of academies is rather heterogeneous. But in spite of their differences, two important objectives have always characterized academies throughout history. The advancement of critical thinking and the promotion of excellence in scientific and scholarly research. And academies have always recognized that freedom and independence of science are a sine qua non for the pursuit of these objectives. This was tragically misjudged by the Emperor Justinian who closed Plato's Aristoteles thousand years after its founding because the ideas within the academy were not in line with what he preferred himself. This critical attitude also uh, came to light in the 16th and 17th century when the universities in Europe were increasingly brought under the yoke of church and state. Academies were founded as safe heavens for oppressed and persecuted scientists to express and debate their sometimes strongly deflecting views and ideas. The power of a modern academy is rooted in its membership 
and the combined scientific and scholarly expertise of its members. They have no vested interests other than the promotion of science and scholarship. In at least three of the roles of an academy, we should expect an important potential contribution to bridging the divide between Islam and the West. In the first place, there is a forum or meeting function. Gatherings, conferences, colloquia, international contacts, reciprocal visits, lectures, exchange of information and periodicals, membership of international organizations, they all express the international collaborative and meeting function of an academy. In these scientific contacts, different scientific views and clashes of opinions occur. However, these differences seldom coincide with the visions between continents or nations. And also these uh, scientists uh, are basically agreeable to reason. Their weaponry consists of arguments and not of instruments of force or power. This open ear and search for the truth are important peers for the bridge between what may be initially disagreeing parties. Of course, there are two preconditions for this uniting function of academies. In the first place, the acceptance of universality of science. The laws of natural and life sciences, but also those of social sciences and humanities, are applicable everywhere. And scientists and scholars from all over the world can, in fact, should participate in this common scientific discourse. Here, I do agree with uh, Hood Boy, Abdul Salam, and Sarah, Sarah Geldin in their vigorous rejection of the claim of otherness of a Mos Muslim scientific experience. Science is not Western. Modern modernization by applying the fruits of science and technology is not Westernization. The early Muslims did not plead separateness of their scientific enterprise either. They did not call for banning or burning Plato's or Aristotle's books, but they had them translated into Arabic and wrote excellent annotations about them, entirely in the tradition of the search for knowledge and truth as prescribed in the original sources of Islam doctrine, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. A second precondition is the acceptance of scientific values. Honesty, freedom of thought, freedom of speech, critical approach, use of reason, the, accept the acceptance of uh, valuability and renouncing absolute truths and tolerance with respect to diverging views. Forms of fundamentalism are undermining these values in parts of the West. But as Abdul Karim Surush and Sadiq Al Azim have shown, this is also the case in many parts of the present Muslim world. Too much influence is exercised by militant Muslim fundamentalists preventing these values to be accepted which is, again, according to Sarah Geldin, Sarah Geldin is the uh, librarian of Alexandra, Alexandria, as you know, uh, which is in contradistinction to the real and true Muslim tradition. The second role of an academy is informative and educational. Since the origin, academies have taken this educational task This educational imperative of academies might even be more prominent in Muslim countries today since universities in many of those countries 
suffer from the absence of freedom of inquiry and lack properly enforced quality standards. Among the top 200 universities of the world, according to the Times Higher Education Supplement Ranking, only three are located in a country with a majority Muslim population. Two in Turkey, Bilkant and Middle East Tech, and one in Egypt, Alexandria. Allow me to take the teaching of biology as a case in point. Among professional biologists, there is no doubt whatsoever that evolutionary principles of Darwin are irrefutable. The positive evidence is truly massive. Uh, hundreds of thousands of mutually corrobor corroborating observations in paleontology, geobiology, and DNA research uh, show this. Denying this fact, as is done in creationistic or neo-creationistic intelligent design is a neo-creationistic approach. Uh, criticisms based on revelations in holy scriptures, the Bible or the Quran, undermines the fundamentals of science, since it seeks to recognize supernaturalistic beliefs as authentic scientific arguments. A group of 67 academies of sciences, together with the ICSU, signed statements a few years ago that rejected all attempts to deny or obscure the overwhelming scientific evidence about the evolution of the Earth and life on this planet. This protest was directed against a powerful conservative orthodox movement, notably in the United States, and in some European countries as well, but also in the Muslim world. There is a strong popular current that rejects evolution as Western and incompatible with Muslim belief. Internet sites such as Yahya and Islam Online mix anti-evolutionist appeals with anti-scientific and anti-Western propaganda. Quite a few Muslim students also in Western universities, including my own in Amsterdam, are attracted to this indoctrination. The figures in Muslim countries themselves are even more disturbing. Thompson, who wrote a book on, on this, uh, concludes, rejecting Darwinism is rejecting the scientific method itself, and thereby condemning the future generations to material and intellectual poverty. You might be pleased to know that among the 67 academies that signed that statement that I talked about on the teaching of evolution, one quarter are based in Muslim countries in Europe, the Middle East, Africa and Asia. So, good for them. Um, by the way, this this also that, that doesn't have to take the form of an anti-evolutionary teaching, but it can also take the form of not informing uh, students about this. I just sat uh, in, in the trip to Doha next to a uh, Saudi uh, engineer, very nice man, uh, sophisticated, pleasant. We had interesting talks. But we also talked about a bit my subject, uh, the evolution biology. And it's surprising to me that he didn't even know the name of Darwin, never heard of Darwin, neither on the primary school, nor secondary school, nor at the university. I think it was quite disturbing for me that this was a totally new name for, for him, uh, an educated engineer. Um, the education function also pertains to a broader community. Uh, toler intolerance, enmity, discrimination and xenophobia are all too often products of ignorance and information. And that applies all over the world. Take the teaching of history. 
nationalistic and selective history education has always fomented further enmity, intolerance and bigotry. National academies, therefore, have the responsibility for offering educational guidance and wisdom to the nation and its leaders, as was rightly submitted by Munif uh, Zubi at uh, a conference in 2005. The third role of an academy that may help uh, bridging divides concerns its advisory function. One can distinguish five types of advices. First, advice based on uh, quality assessments of persons or systems or universities. Secondly, advice regarding science policy, including, including foresights, trends in science in the future. Thirdly, science for policy advice, advice regarding uh, pending policy decisions uh, that is based on scientific research and expertise. Four, advice on ethical and social questions related to or generated by scientific research. And five, advice on research integrity, the proper behavior of scientists. In their often prestigious formal and informal advisory capacity, academies of science and their associations can stress uh, these basic values of science and research integrity and thus further uh, dialogue and understanding. What are these uh, scientific values? Well, let me summarize them again. I've touched upon a, a number of them already. Uh, rational reasoning, solving problems through rational reasoning, a critical approach to established theories, looking for evidence through experimental or empirical facts or observations, no supernatural, uh, intestable explanations or interpretations are allowed as scientific arguments. Independence and absolute freedom of mind. Freedom of thought, speech and interaction. The realization that no one possesses the truth and that no one has absolute vision and that all theories may prove valuable in the light of new discoveries or new evidence. And that leads to tolerance with respect to different views or explanations. The famous Iranian poet Hafez said once did nicely, in these two expressions lies the peace in this world and the next, with friends magnanimity, with enemy, enemies tolerance. And then the principles of research integrity as we defined for instance in the just finished European code of, uh, of conduct for research integrity honesty, reliability, objectivity, and independence. Some Muslim scholars and scientists have uh, insisted that these values are the product of European enlightenment, postulated by philosophers like Spinoza, Locke, Kant, and are therefore Western values. With all due respect, I propound to refute this objection. Spinoza, Locke and Kant were not just addressing the West, but the entire uh, intellectual world. The Enlightenment, in many ways a reflection of its time, also bore fruit for universal science and not just for Western science. And again, as shown by authoritative Muslim authors, these central thoughts of enlightenment and core values of science are not at all at variance with classical Muslim values and traditions. In, this, in the last uh, uh, few minutes, a few words on a controversy that may have influential bearing uh, upon uh, the subject of discussion, both in the West 
and in the East. And that is the relationship between science and religion. Throughout history, the relation has been uh, conflictuous. The relationship between autonomous reason and divine revelations have been a resource of uh, conflict. I found a revealing statement of Abu Allah al-Ma'ari in 1057. He says, the people of this earth are two, those with a mind and no religion, and those with religion and no mind. Uh, I know what they mean, but I disagree, as, as I will show. Discussion throughout history on her heretical science, findings were forbidden, books and manuscripts were burned, scientists themselves silenced, isolated, imprisoned, or put to death. Obviously, scientific truth based on facts and on proof of observation can come in basic conflict with truths as revealed in holy scriptures and as interpreted by religious leaders. How could these two different worlds ever be reconciled? Before I try to, to uh, find an answer, let us uh, realize two important points. One, the conflict between religion and science certainly does not run parallel to the divide Islam Christendom. I think that's important to realize. Both religious worlds have had their share of this contention. In the West, churches have been fighting the ideas of Galileo, Spinoza, Voltaire, and Thomas More. We still have the Bible Belt in uh, the United States uh, resisting scientific findings. In the Muslim history, we have seen the early attacks of the influential Al-Ghazali and uh, Abu Allah al-Ma'ari on the rational and tolerant views of the philosophers Al-Kindi and Ibn Sina, calling some thoughts of the latter heretical, which is, of course, rejectable, but not as bad, but others even apostatical. There is a word Kufr, is that, is that an Islamic world? Okay. Later, in the flowering period of the Muslim science in Spain, we see again resistance of, for instance, Ibn Rushd, uh, we call him Averroes, uh, against orthodox repression of science. Burgel, who wrote a book on this uh, conflict in those times, um, concludes uh, that Orthodox Muslim theology has always tried to dominate rather than to inspire science. A second remark I have to make, that is that there is little doubt that the intolerant anti-science attitude of some Islamic clergy bears some responsibility for the backward state of science in many Muslim countries, as is defended by Sarah Geldin, Hood Boy and uh, Abu Salam. But this is not the only, not the sole determining factor. As for instance, uh, Segal indicates, other factors holding back scientific development include demographics, insufficient mastery of English as the main language of scientific communication, poor learning objectives and practice, road learning as a legacy in many Quranic madrasas, uh, lack of research uh, capabilities and experience, lack of funding and resources, powerless professional societies, and authoritarian regimes that deny freedom of inquiry or dissent. Badran, uh, again in the, the, the conference 2005, pointed out the damaging indifference of Arab countries towards science and technology activities. Back to our basic question. Are scientific rationality and religion-based conventions implicable, or is there a way to reconcile these two? 
let me introduce a distinction that I made earlier, not as a dogma, but as a uh, modest uh, heuristic. The distinction between uh, science in stricto sensu and science as the process of knowledge accumulation. The former, there in the former there is no room for norms other than logical analytical norm. Objectivity has to be maintained against any pressure from external sources, including religion. Science should be allowed to analyze and interpret the facts and findings without any ideological or religious interference, and should be, in this sense, value-free. This is the science that has an independent and universal character, and that is the backbone of innovations that drive economic and intellectual progress. What if the scientific truths are at odds with the truths as revealed in Holy Scriptures? The answer is, they cannot. Uh, they cannot be at odds. The Bible, the Torah, and the Koran are not historical, geological, or biological textbooks. They do not intend to give a scientific explanation of physical or social phenomena. They are imaginative texts that attempt to help people to understand the meaning of life, to guide and inspire them, to provide hope and consolation. Science, on the other hand, is a world of falsifiable knowledge, logical consistency, verification, and validation. These two worlds cannot be at variance any more than a poem can be at variance with experimental physics. Steve Gold suggested some, something similar when he described these worlds of religion and science as two non-overlapping magisteria, noma. That means that both worlds should not hamper each other. Religious authorities should not interfere with the scientific analysis and interpretation and should not try to impose supernatural courses of ex explanation upon the scientists. On the other hand, also the scientific endeavors to try to prove that religion is nonsense and that God does not exist, Dawkins, Hitchens, Stenger, these attempts are meaningless. The question whether God or Allah exists cannot be a scientific question and can therefore not be answered scientifically. However, we come upon quite a different picture, uh, and I conclude with that, if we consider science as the process of knowledge accumulation. Here we see science as a societal process enfolded in a non-scientific context of often religion-based convictions and ethical choices. These relate to the philosophical assumptions that underlie the theories and paradigmata that relate to the choice of subjects of hypothesis to be researched with, for instance, no-go or slow-go decisions in the pursuit of scientific questions. Stem cell research, is that allowed? Can the scientist engage in anthrax or napalm research? And many other ethical questions. It uh, relates to the manner in which experiments are conducted. Appropriate care for animals, patients, environment, etc. And, of course, the always pressing question, what is being done with the research results and by whom? Can the scientist be held or is he responsible for misinterpretation, selective use or abuse? And how is one to repair or to prevent this? All kinds of uh, very interesting non-scientific questions. In this sense, uh, as a human and social activity, uh, science is anything but value-free. The scientist is faced with a variety of moral and normal dilemmas and questions for the answering of which non-scientific considerations of ethical and normative nature are required. Here, 
religion and normative traditions do have an important and legitimate role to play. And in the discussion of ethical and social dimensions of research is therefore a crucial terrain for discussions among academies of science and humanities from countries with different cultural and religious traditions. Conclusion. Through, freer, through free and clear communication and open communication, academies really can contribute to understanding, concordance and agreement within and between societies and cultures. Communication with the national intellectual and student population but also with the international scientific community. Conferences like the present one are extremely useful. I hope that in the future a more frequent and more intensive dialogue between Muslim and Western scientists and scholars, and especially between Muslim and Western academies of sciences and associations of academies of science will take place. Discussing the general issues like uh, this conference and possibly leading to partnerships between Western and Muslim academies. And I certainly will recommend this to our own organization to take up this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Grant, for your analysis. Please, uh, you surely set the stage for the uh, accompanying presentation. Uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Michael Clegg Foreign Secretary of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and uh, Mike, you have the floor. <laughs> oh, okay. let, let, let me begin by congratulating the Islamic Academy of Sciences on its 25th anniversary. On behalf of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, we're we're very pleased to have this association with the Islamic Academies, um, which has established a, a strong record and progressive record as a major voice for science in the OIC, OIC countries. Um, the Islamic Academy is also a champion for science-based development in the region. And we also will be having an anniversary in another year and a half, and so, um, We'll be celebrating our 150th anniversary in the same tradition as the Islamic Academy. I'd also like to make a personal comment, and that is that I've been to several meetings of the Islamic Academy over the last decade, and I feel that I have many close personal friends now among the membership, and it's a pleasure to be back with you again. Now, my, my assignment was to talk about the role of academies of sciences in bridging the U.S.-Islamic world divide and specifically to address the approach of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So I will stick uh, closely to that theme and let me begin with just a, a few words about my organization to put it into context. Uh, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences is a fairly new academy in the world constellation of science academies even though we will be celebrating 150 years, it was chartered during our civil war in a time of great stress in the United States. It was actually chartered by an act of the US Congress and signed into law by President Lincoln in 1863. The, despite this, the Academy is a private organization. We are not part of the US government. Uh, we do not receive a direct subvention from the U.S. government. Our act of incorporation stipulates two things. One, the establishment of an honorific society, the Academy, which elects annually U.S. scientists to membership based upon meritorious achievement in science. And being elected to the U.S. Academy for an American scientist is now regarded as one of the highest forms of recognition available to American scientists. We include now about 2,000 members. Uh, we also have about 400 foreign members from around the world that we're very proud to include in our organization. 
The, the other element of our act of incorporation was to require that the academy provide advice on issues of science and technology to the U.S. government whenever requested by the government with no compensation. The, uh, this makes us one of the first sort of think tanks in the U.S. style, and we have been providing advice on various issues of science and technology for 150 years. We give advice on a wide variety of topics, and in fact, we publish about 200 book-length reports on various issues of science and technology every year. And those reports are available free to anyone in the world as PDFs on our website if you're interested in them. And examples of recent reports are a four-volume series just completed in the last year or so on energy futures and the challenge of an energy transformation in the Americas, but much of that is relevant to the rest of the world. We have a series of reports on climate change and adaptation to climate change. Uh, one very interesting report raises the question, if, if we were to be able to set a target of 500 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, what would we have to do to, to hold to that target? Even with that target, global temperatures are likely to rise by about uh, three degrees centigrade over the rest of this century. And this kind of question reveals um, uh, very major efforts that would have to be made. We do reports on things like forensic science, what can the legal system, what kinds of forensic science can the legal system rely on, and what degree of confidence can they place in different sorts of forensic measurements. We do reports on water resource issues, on biodiversity loss, and on a range of other topics. We also do reports that are devoted to the health of science. So we do, for example, decadal reports that try to set priorities in the field of astronomy. We do reports that look at the future opportunities in areas like astrophysics, for example, and many other areas of science. So many of these reports are relevant to a global audience, and I commend them to you. And that's the major work of our organization. How is it funded? About 80% of the reports that we do are requested by the government, and the government issues a contract which pays for the costs of producing the report on, well, for each specific report, and that actually provides the funding for the organization. Our reports are generally valued, viewed as the gold standard in science and technology advice in the United States. And they often influence the U.S. government in its approaches to different difficult policy issues. All right, so that's a little bit of background on the organization. Now, what about international activities? Uh, the office that I occupy is an elected office, a foreign secretary. It sounds a little anachronistic in this era, but the office was actually established in the const original constitution of the academy in 1863, following the practice of European academies, where scientific communication with other scientists and other academies within Europe was an important aspect of the commerce of science. And so one of the two elements of my job as stipulated in that original con uh, the constitution is to maintain correspondence with other academies around the world. So I'm here fulfilling that role, that historical and traditional role. So um, why did our founders see international science as important? Well, first, the, as we've already heard in, in Peter's very interesting talk, the culture of science emphasizes cooperation and knowledge sharing. And 
that is not constrained by political boundaries. The shared culture goes back to the origins of European science academies and, and earlier um, with um, the establishment, for example, of some of the early post-Renaissance academies like the Lin Chai. So our 1863 constitution stipulated this communication as part of the role of a science academy. So why is science cooperation important? Well, we only have to look at the fruits of the 20th century to appreciate the value of science. It is estimated that more than 50% of economic growth in the United States through the 20th century was the direct result of advances in science and technology. Human life expectancy has increased by more than 25 years during the 100 years of the 20th century also because of developments in science and medicine. So the benefits to us all of science are immense. But I'm here really to look to the future rather than the past and so looking to the future there are many challenges that will require science and technology solutions in the 21st century. We're going to have to figure out how to manage and adapt to climate change, how to make a major transition in our use of energy on the planet, how to manage water resources in a way that will assure uh, equitable distribution of water and food to the global population, how to manage emerging diseases, which are often unpredictable in their occurrence, how to manage problems like biodiversity loss. So the 21st century will pose many big challenges that require science and technology solutions. And dealing with these future challenges will require increased international science cooperation. And that means that it will require cultivating our best young people on a global basis. So I'd like to take up these two topics in turn, dealing with future challenges and cultivating our best young people. In the context of cooperation, we do a number of things to foster international science cooperation. Over the years, we've had a number of bilateral projects with other of our partner academies on major issues. So for example, we uh, work bilateral with, bilaterally with the academies of Jordan, Palestine, and Israel on water issues as an effort to bridge not only to deal with the key problems of water in the Jordan Valley, but also to bridge cultures. We've had a series of projects over the last decade with the Chinese Academy of Sciences working on issues of energy and environment. Uh, we released a very key report that initiated this series back in 2002 entitled Energy Futures in China and the United States, which was certainly a prescient report as we look back over the decade. We've done reports on water issues with our counterparts in Mexico. But our ability to sustain intensive bilateral projects is limited. We're, we're not that large, large an organization and we don't have the resources to work bilaterally with the many partners that we would like to work with around the world. So for us, multilateral cooperation is essential. And one of the main venues for multilateral cooperation for us is the IAP, the Global Network of Science Academies, and I'm pleased that two of the leaders of that effort are with us today, Yves Kare and Mohammed Hassan, who've been wonderful global leaders uh, in this Science Academy movement. We also work with the International Council for Science as a major part of our portfolio of international work. Uh, with the IAP, we've been particularly engaged in projects like advancing science education and access to digital electronic information, global problems of water resources, and so forth. 
Now, things have, have changed um, with the change of administration in the United States and the uh, Obama administration views science as a, an important instrument of diplomacy. And in, as part of that strategy, we've heard about the Cairo speech, um, the administration appointed a series of science envoys, mostly, although not exclusively, to Muslim countries. The first three envoys were Bruce Alberts, the former president of our academy, Zerwail from Egypt, and Zerhouni, who was formerly the head of our National Institutes of Health. Um, and our organization has also been asked to play a more important role in this effort of science diplomacy engaging us with the rest of the world. And I would like to mention for you one project that speaks directly to science cooperation that we're just in the process of initiating. It's called the PEER Project. And it's um, an effort to provide a linkage for individual investigator research support in countries around the world. Uh, any country that has a USAID mission, and there are 79 such countries, an individual from that country can link up with an NSF funded investigator in the United States and receive a grant from USAID for a cooperative project with the NSF funded investigator. So there is an a real opportunity for science support and science collaboration under this newly initiated program. And uh, we have been asked by the uh, government to manage that program at the academy. Now, now, the other element that I want to address is the keys to the future. That is young scientists and what can be done to uh, bring young scientists together and to stimulate more effective collaboration. We in the academy have long been concerned about career development for young scientists. And uh, about 20 years ago, we began a program called Frontiers of Science, which was aimed at assisting young and mid-career scientists and bringing them together within the United States. The Frontiers of Science has a very simple concept. It's a symposium with about five sessions, each session devoted to a completely different area of science. And the challenge for the participants is that they have to present their work in a way that a scientifically literate audience of non-specialists can understand and appreciate. Well, it's turned out in the 20 years since we initiated this program that it's been very successful. And it's, the audience, the, the participants are highly selected. It, these uh, have brought together multidisciplinary collaborations which have been unique and very fruitful. Eight of the alumni of the Frontiers program have received Nobel Prizes over the years. Um, a number have been elected to our academies. So it's a very successful program, and as a, as a consequence, the word got out, and about 15 years ago, the German, Germans came to us and said, could we do a U.S.-German Frontiers of Science? And we said yes, that we would do that, and we initiated together with the Germans an effective U.S.-German Frontiers of Science. And then the Japanese approached us, and we initiated a Japanese American Frontiers of Science, and then following that, um, China, we have a U.S.-China Frontiers of Science, India, and Indo-U.S. Frontiers of Science. So this has become internationalized. Now, as a result of the Science Envoy program, when Bruce Alberts visited Indonesia, one of the first things that he discussed with the Indonesian officials that he met with on that visit was the possibility of doing a joint U.S.-Indonesian frontiers of science because we had not done one with a Muslim country before. And I'm happy to say that that was initiated and, the, and a successful Frontiers event was concluded about a month ago in Indonesia. Very recently, we have also done the first Arab American Frontiers of Science. Um, 
This was launched in Kuwait with a great deal of support from the Kuwait Institute of Scientific Research. And it was a challenge because there are 22 Arab countries. It's not like a bilateral cooperation. It means that we had to reach out and uh, inform young Arab scientists of this opportunity in 22 different countries and then get applications and select the top applicants from that group. And I'm very pleased to tell you that the first Arab American Frontiers of Science was just held this, this past week in Kuwait. It, had in, it included 80, 80, 80 young scientists from 18 Arab countries. So we were able to get participants from 18 of the 22 Arab countries. And it also included 27 uh, young scientists from the United States. And I was present at the meeting. It was highly successful. Um, we hope that we can continue this Arab American Frontiers of Science program. We've made a commitment to continue it into the future. So let me just then conclude by saying that the key thing for us is to look, at the, look to the future and to plant the seeds now that will guarantee a better future for humanity, for all of our peoples. And to do that, it is imperative that we work together so that we can provide a decent life for all people in the world based on scientific cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Clegg, for that very interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some ideas here that the Islamic World Academy of Sciences may want to examine uh, further. Let me uh, proceed to the third speaker this afternoon. Uh, this will be from uh, Ms. Alice Rubenstein, President and CEO of the New York Academy of Sciences, who's going to relate to us some of his uh, recent experiences in uh, SDI for the Islamic world. Alice, you have the floor. Thank you, Zachary, Shafran. Where, let's see, where do you see it? Oh, yeah, I see it. Uh, if you all give me one second. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, wow, the lights are bright. Uh, good afternoon. I want to particularly thank the IAS for inviting me to uh, one of my favorite cities and to meet you all, and in particular to thank. Uh, the IS and, uh, and uh, their leader, uh, Mr. Zubi, for joining uh, an alliance that I will describe uh, in a moment. I was asked, and I will try to be quite quick about it, uh, to cover some new, I think, areas that may be a bit new to you, uh, because I believe in following my chairman's requests uh, to give you a little bit of a chance, hopefully, to talk about these issues. Um, in effect, uh, I think uh, the concept that's been discussed for three days or two days is, is how can the Islamic world catch up uh, in a race to be competitive globally in the areas of science and technology, not merely for social benefit, but also for economic gain. And this is a very, very difficult problem considering the fact that, as we all know, the developed world uh, is uh, driving very uh, hard to compete with itself. And, this, uh, and in this sense, I'm going to give you a little bit of background this is my agenda for the talk, and I'm going to be asking you to read these quickly so that I don't have to repeat them, uh, but we're going to talk about the uh, global competition to build knowledge economies, uh, the challenges for political leaders in transforming their economies by using uh, to create knowledge-based uh, economies, how uh, cities and states are trying to foster innovation ecologies. Uh, I'm going to touch very briefly on something we did in New York. Uh, because I'm going to try to be highlighting in doing this the, challenge, the really enormous challenge that lays before, lies before the Islamic uh, or M Muslim uh, majority countries in order to uh, be able to be competitive. Uh, and then I want to uh, address, as I was requested by the IAS, a notion about how one could scale collaborations uh, that uh, take off from what Mike Clegg was addressing, but on a much grander scale because to me, unless there's an enormous effort to bring people together on this, there won't be a catching up. 
except in very individual places like Turkey, we begin to see that there. So I have just to touch on six themes that are, uh, that, that are gonna be the background for this talk. Uh, we all know that advanced nations cannot succeed uh, based on uh, manufacturing and financial economies. And we also know that for the first time in human history, most people, more people are living in uh, cities rather than rural areas. Um, so that uh, in effect, the grand challenges of the 21st century, climate, health, in infrastructure, and so forth, are acute in urban areas. And, uh, but at the same time, the great opportunities uh, like wealth, healthcare, accessibility, education, and culture are found in the most uh, successful and attractive cities. Uh, uh, this is my little only joke of the, of the session that somehow in the 21st century we're back in early Renaissance Italy where the real action is a competition between competing city-states and not really national governments in many respects. Uh, and the visionary mayors or governors of regions are the ones that are doing the interesting uh, stuff about this. And so finally, I want to point out that if you think about that this way, the most efficient way of building a successful city is to solve all of its problems at once, to build economic strength by fostering innovations that improve the uh, health and life of the citizens and at the same time the sustainability of, of the city. Now, why do I address this? Because there are certain conditions that are required and, and you're going to, when I'm hoping that you watch this, think about Islamic cities in this context. Uh, you have to have, to be successful, lots of young and well-educated young people, world-class higher education systems, dynamic corporations and corporate leaders, a strong financial sector, cultural ambience that recruits and retains talent, uh, government uh, planning that uh, in ensures good urban lifestyle. A very important element is a public-private commitment to science and technology and not just manufacturing and finance. And to me, one of the most uh, overlooked and single most important elements are robust networks of academia, industry, science, and finance, which is rarely seen in most cities. Um, why are many large cities failing? Uh, please look at the list on the left. These are the institutional failures that are really based on poor linkages between the different silos that don't work together and therefore you don't have any uh, sense of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. On the right side, I'm gonna now put a whole series of uh, individual weaknesses that start with Student myopia, it's not their fault. They don't, get, they don't get a big vision. But also because they don't have role models, they don't have well-thinking uh, uh, faculty that are broadly uh, based in their uh, vision. Uh, and this extends even to, to corporate leaders and, and local philanthropists and, and the financial sector and so forth. So I just touch on that quickly because I'm gonna now uh, mention a couple of examples of what that the great cities uh, are trying to do to make sure that they can overcome this because if you look at this, then you wonder how will the Islamic world uh, catch up? And I'm, I, I don't want you to be depressed when you look at this. We're, I'm gonna try to provide a possible answer. But here is the most frightening thing of all if you're worrying about the um, Muslim majority uh, cities and, uh, and, and, and trying to compete. Um, what city in the world would you say uh, is in the least needing to work together and create these robust networks to succeed, if not Boston, where the institutions are arguably the most successful at raising funding and being successful. And yet, what do they do? We see Harvard and MIT and all the hospitals trying to put together an alliance which has become the Broad Institute, and without going into any descriptions or discussions of it, uh, probably and hopefully you're aware of it, um, a good example of what comes from doing this when two institutions that usually compete for money, for funding, and, and for alumni, and for philanthropists actually work together, they get $65 million from a Mexican, the richest person in the world, who arguably should be supporting his own country, and he's putting money into Boston. Now another quick version of this without details is California, where you see that three extremely fine institutions decided to work together in a hot area of science because Berkeley didn't have a medical school, UCSF didn't have really a core research life science uh, a facility, much 
less the great computing and engineering power of UCS uh, uh, Santa, Santa uh, Cruz. Um, and they created the QB3, or Quantitative Biomedical Research Institute. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, in places that are that powerful. It can be in places that you would have never dreamed anything exciting would happen in the world of science and technology. And my example is Albany, which was a city that you wouldn't have ever even have thought of and has created, if you are aware of it, the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering with a very big seed grant from the state governor and a billion dollar uh, 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 investment by IBM that led to one of the most remarkable um, centers of collaborative, pre-competitive, and, and actually just straight out research. Uh, just look at this list, which you don't have to read, to see the number of partners that have moved to Albany to do their work there. What are the uh, uh, initial results in only seven or eight years? 250 companies moving in there, 2,500 jobs, $7 billion invested in the center itself, and $25 billion in the state of New York, a state upstate which has been a failure in most regards. So my point about this is it proves that it, even places that you might have thought were, were backwaters are capable of dramatically changing themselves. That's the good news. Now, uh, $1 billion, by the way, in revenue a year. Now, London has tried a project like this. Um, again, I won't go into details because of time, but Cambridge, King's, and, and, uh, and Imperial could never even work together until they asked our academy to bring them together as a neutral entity. Once we did that, we launched for them the Global Medical Excellence Cluster, which then brought in Oxford and Cambridge the hospitals and attracted many companies. They actually do events every year now. They did one actually oddly enough in New York in our headquarters, which we're proud of. But this is an effort in London to do similar things. You're all familiar with what Singapore has tried to do by creating a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. And I wanna just name some cities that are trying very hard to play catch up. You've heard maybe about the Moscow Skolkovo project very interesting, no time to talk about it. I'm very proud of our relationship with a very dynamic Prime Minister, Prime Minister Najib in, in Malaysia, who's asked us to work with uh, his great science advisor to my left to try to make Kuala Lumpur a model uh, smart city. And uh, finally, I'm gonna just touch on things that we did in New York for the reason that I think it identifies what cities uh, in the Islamic world could do if something very unusual, <coughs> excuse me, innovative was done. So the often forgotten dimension in all of this is political leaders like to build buildings. We all know that. And lots of biotech parks are made everywhere and nothing happens in them. What's missing is the capacity development. So even in New York, which wasn't thought of as a great science center despite its scale, eight years ago we had those same problems uh, that I mentioned before <clears throat> particularly the ones in red, uh, and institutionally, and the same problems with the students. <clears throat> Excuse me very much, I don't know what's with my voice. Um, we have launched six unique uh, initiatives in New York to overcome that. And I'm gonna just touch on them quickly. Region-wide career mentoring, creation of hot science communities that force the best scientists and their postdocs who would never work together from the top institutions to actually come together on a regular basis every a year, four or five times. Unique web-based dissemination initiatives that also expanded the local audience by tenfold and marketed New York's strengths uh, globally. And then th this attracted industry into the city and we even have created the first life science angel network. Um, I'm gonna just show you that what regional career mentoring means is that all the universities and academic medical centers actually work together. And what they do is they give us a little bit of support so that we do this type of skill development you don't see in almost any city in the world. Um, give the sense to PhD students and postdocs about where careers are going. Um, also to create about 25 super hot field groups that bring together those top young scientists so that there's a uh, synergy in the city. <clears throat> this is a, a, just a screen that shows what you could find on our website. The e-briefings that we do, where science journalists make a very easy 
uh, to quick availability of the events that we do, working uh, with the speakers so that you can get an overview and get out, but get all the way drilled down to PowerPoints. And so here is just a kind of a concept overview of what goes on now in New York that you probably don't know. Imagine that the uh, PhD students and postdocs get 15 career mentoring events a year, 50 Frontier of Science seminars, six international conferences, 4,000 students attending events, 8,000 junior and senior scientists at the events, and participation of all sorts of companies, I'm gonna show you that, and so on, you see that. And then also, this is the type of companies that now play a major role in New York that never did before, uh, and there are even more. Um, this is, a, I guess I don't have really time to tell you about how Pfizer uh, was able to uh, uh, create one agreement with seven academic medical centers uh, because of us creating a nice opportunity so they didn't have to fight with seven different tech transfer offices. And they put 50 million and 20 people into New York. This is our life science angel network, which I will skip, except to say that nine uh, presented companies were, were, uh, were chosen out of 50, three were funded in the first year, now there will be six. And so that's the beginning of something that we'd like to think is the creation of small and medium businesses in New York. Now, how do you adapt this to the Islamic cities and can they be built? And the problems are, of course, can you do a social networking platform to create virtual uh, uh, versions of what I mentioned? Why not? Since you've seen in the Arab Spring what young people can do if they have a virtual network. Could you create hot science uh, communities virtually? Could you identify home cities with centers of excellence for each community? Hold a moving set of physical meetings, link individual members via social network? Could you promote Islamic centers of excellence through e-briefings? Could you create, attract companies and VCs to fund the best and brightest uh, through open innovation competitions as well as physical events if they knew that they didn't have to deal with every individual university but could come to one place where the best and brightest existed. Who could do that? So a public-private partnership could be created and in fact what happened about a year ago was that people like Atta Ur Rahman who is here and Mohammed Hassan um, and, uh, and uh, the head of the uh, Arab Science and Technology Foundation came to me and said, if we all work together, since we're all underfunded and we're all unable to do these things, maybe we could get serious money and we would work together and we would launch something like this. Would you be willing to just sort of be the outside entity that holds it together? We said we would be willing to, but how, could, what, how would we get the money from the ministries and the higher education entities? And they said, you know, create a kind of a, a leadership council of, of Nobelists. And then basically the sovereign wealth funds and others would come, companies would come and so forth. Uh, that's sort of the quick look at that. We actually have done that. This is where we stand. We got commitments from those institutions. We got UNESCO coming to us begging to partner with us. And then we've gotten, thanks to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, um, a serious commitment if we could get it launched. Um, and we have a lot of global companies that are excited to do this, including the five Nobelists that we were asked to put on this council to make um, certain philanthropists in some of the wealthy countries willing to put some money up. The issue is, however, that you can have a visionary initiative, but if the Islamic world remains sort of tribalized, and if the wealth will only support something in an individual country, how will you do what really needs to be done? which is to connect, and that's the bottom line of this, the talent pools that exist in the great cities where there's very little money, very little resources, and very little vision to those cities like the one we're in now, where there's tons of money, there's tons of vision, there's lots of ambition, and there's no students. How could we do that? We could do it all together. That's sort of the end of my, and with a little bit of money. How much do I think? 10 million a year, that's what I think. That's where we are. Uh, is it too much to ask? 10 million is nothing. I think people could do that easily. Uh, any ideas you want to have, I'd be interested. Send me an email. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alice, for that quick uh, description of a very interesting project. Uh, 
To conclude this uh, segment of the session, let me invite Professor Yves Corre uh, from France to talk about the role of academies of sciences in bridging political divide. Yves, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, according to the watch and to the agenda, I think I have eight minutes. Will you give me ten? Uh, you can. Okay. Uh, well, let me first uh, tell you the joy which I have to be here in a region of the world where I had never been. And also, of course, my thanks to the uh, Committee of Organization. Uh, in the title which, of the talk which has been uh, proposed to me, I shall just take two words. Uh, academies and political. About the academies, I shall be very short because many things have been told up to now. Um, there are three major characteristics of an academy. First of all, it should be good scientifically, even excellent. And this is not always uh, so simple to, to examine this situation. Is an academy good from this point of view? Well, here we have the so-called Abraham's theorem, which says that if in a country you have an academy of sciences A, let us say, it is good if and only if you cannot in the same country create another academy B, the members of which not being members of A and this academy being better. You see, this is a clear definition of what is good and what is not good as far as scientific expertise is given. The second characteristic is extremely important. This has been stated so many times. I shall just say one word, independence. Independence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the political, the religious, the economical powers. And here I shall just mention that if we do not know always what is independence, we know very well what is dependence. And from this point of view, we have been, all of us, very upset by what happened recently, a few weeks ago in Turkey, where the government passed a law, I think this was August 27, it's very recent, where the academy, marvel, an excellent academy, Tuba, you know, we know this academy, it's a very good academy in a very big country, uh, very well uh, suited for this country, and the government decided that only one third of the members would be elected by the pairs, uh, two thirds being essentially nominated by the government. So in this case, this means that this, if this does happen in Turkey, the next academy will not be no longer an academy. This is as simple as, as that. So this is a very, very touchy thing, the independence of academies. And the third characteristic, main characteristic is the stability, because generally the members are elected for life, and this uh, gives a stability which is very very important in vis-a-vis -vis governments where ministers change every year or one year or two years sometimes. So it's very important to have a stable academy. Of course, stability means sometimes that an academy may become a, a home for the aged uh, because people become more older and older now and you have many members who are 90 years of age. So many academies have in the last 10 or 15 years taken a, a, a rule that, uh, for example, half of the new members should be less than, for example, 55 years, or years old. The last point about academies, and this is a dramatic point, this is the number of women. There is a scandal in these academies of sciences that the number of women in the, is incredibly and scandalously small. There are only, I think, three academies in which the proportion of women is higher than 20%, which is not very high. This is, as far as I know, Latvia, Cuba, and South Africa. And all the so-called big academies have numbers typically like five, six, seven percent. This is a real problem, and we all have to fight against this, this problem. So this was just a few words about the academies. Now I come to the word political, political divide. In political, I hear, of course, poly, that is a city, the city. And uh, the problem raised is how can the academies of sciences play a role for the citizen and more generally for the society? Well, um, this is a relatively recent problem. I think that in the old times, let us say 100 years ago, the academies of sciences were mostly interested in science, 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 discoveries, 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 and that was fine, but they were not so much interested in society. So this is a new trend, and we can be happy of this new trend. I have no time to, to give many examples. You will not be surprised if I give one specific example, with it, which is 
scientific education. I say scientific, I do not say science. Scientific education of children. We have spoken yesterday and today very much of the science education of, uh, of uh, students in universities, and this is very important to have good scientists, to have good uh, engineers, etc. But we have the problem of the children starting at uh, age three, typically. That is uh, the problem of their scientific education. That is, having them, having the children, having them a, a scientific view over the world which is around them, first of all, and secondly, having a scientific way of thinking, which is completely different from learning science, you see? And so this is a new trend also, and uh, many people are surprised that the academies are involved in this problem. Many people, when it started, let us say 20 years ago, said, oh, oh with the academies, but this should, this, they have nothing to do with the children. And even many academicians said that. We have nothing to do with the children. This is a problem of the teachers. And we now know that this, on the contrary, is extremely important, that not only children, but teachers should be confronted to high-level scientists. We know that now by experience, it's extremely important that the academies now look at the problem of the children, not only of the students, university students. It all started about 15, 20 years ago, essentially in two countries, now it's worldwide, in two countries which, were, which are the US and France. In the US, you have two marvelous persons, uh, many more, of course, but at least two, uh, Nobel laureate uh, Leon Lederman in Chicago, and the president, uh, at that time, the president of the Academy, of the National Academy, Bruce Alberts, who have been so uh, active in the problem of children. Both of them said, the problem is children. It's not really. When you have students in the university, they are prepared to be scientists. And OK, that's fine, but uh, the problem is here. And in France, another Nobel laureate, uh, did I say that Léon Lederman was a Nobel laureate in physics? And in France, Nobel laureate uh, Georges Charpak. And they had the certainty in their mind that the problem, I repeat, was the children. So what do I mean by uh, scientific, um, scientific uh, teaching of, uh, of the mind of the children? Well, what they proposed, the three of them, uh, it was called hands-on in the US, it was called la main à la patte in France, never mind. And now there is a more general term, which is IPSE, inquiry-based science education. And in this kind of education, uh, essentially, a lesson is as follows. It may be different, but uh, the structure of the lesson starts by a question. It's incredibly important to have questions and to stimulate the children to ask questions. So it starts about a, with a question about, about nature, about something around them. Secondly, it goes through the hypothesis of the children, so that the children are required to make their imagination work. That is, the faculty which they have, or, or perhaps which they don't have, to create images, imagination, images of what is behind the wall, you see? Imagination, hypothesis. Third, make a small experiment, very simple-minded experiment by small groups, uh, where they touch the matter, you see? They see things, real things, an experiment. And then write down something on their exercise book, because we all have noticed the incredible link between science, seen from, from the children, and uh, between science and mastery of language. So you see, in, in the classroom for these children, it's exactly in a very modest way what happens in a laboratory. A question about nature, the hypothesis of the scientist, the experiment or the theory, and then uh, writing an article, you see? So the children are asked to work as if they were in a laboratory. Not at all to learn science on a blackboard or on a screen. No, this is not the way to do it. And you see that this will take time. So it is not a question of teaching them science and science and laws and theorems. No, it's a question of changing their mind. Um, so, what, I repeat, uh, do we expect from such a teaching uh, of, of the children? Well, first, there is the important question of uh, the questioning. Uh, this is to stimulate their curiosity. In my time, this is perhaps long ago, but we were not curious. At least we were supposed not to be curious. We wouldn't ask any question in the classroom. Here we ask them to ask questions. And this is extremely important. Here I would like just to, to tell the very short story which I heard from uh, Abdul Salam, you know, the Nobel Prize, Pakistani's Nobel Prize. You know that he had his Nobel Prize um, with uh, 
Stephen Weinberg for the beautiful uh, theory of uh, elementary particles. And once he said to, he, they were very good friends, and once he said to, to Stephen, Stephen, tell me, why are there so many Jewish uh, physicists who have the Nobel Prize? Which is true, there are perhaps 25% of the Nobel Prize in physics which go to uh, Jewish uh, scientists, American, German, etc which is much higher than the proportion of growth. And Stephen had this marvelous answer. He said, oh, well, you are right, but it's not at all that we are more clever. It is not at all that we are, by we, he meant Jews. He was a Jew. Uh, more clever or more rapid, etc. No, the, the, the reason is that when a child comes back home after school uh, in, the, in the afternoon, his or her mother will not tell him or her did you work okay, uh, well today? Did you make your exercise for tomorrow? Have you been a wise boy or girl? No, 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 no. He, the mother will tell him, did you ask enough good questions today? You see? So, riding the curiosity and so that the children should be curious all their life along. One should be curious in life, but should never accept as uh, given things which are given in the press. Or we should be curious all, all our life. Second is the touching of reality as uh, compared to the uh, virtuality of the screen. Etc. They will touch the matter. They will make an experiment through so the reality. Third, uh, distinguishing the true and the false. We are in a world, uh, especially in the West, where the philosophy has taught us that everything is relative, that you can say everything, you can say things on their contrary, which is not wrong, but for a child, there must be things which are true and things which are false. If I drop a stone, it will fall, it will not go up. There is a truth here, and the child should be in contact with the truth. Uh, then there is, fourth, there is the distinction between the, the separation of parameters. This also for life, for the citizen in society, it's extremely important to be able to separate the parameters, or at least to distinguish when the parameters have not been separated in the press, in the TV, for a conflict, for a climate, etc. So many parameters together, and uh, the, the journalist will tell you, this is the responsible. It's possible, but it's not sure. And for, to, to give an example, a very simple experiment, which is done in many classes, is the one of the pendulum. You have a pendulum, you have a string, pendulum, which does this, and so there are several parameters, at least three. Generally, the children will find three of them. There are more, but at least three. The length of the pendulum, the weight, one kilogram, one gram, and the angle through which it has been uh, thrown. You see, three parameters. You have to separate them and to find out, and this is not so simple. And when they have done that with the pendulum, it will take one hour sometimes, they will know m something for all their life. That's uh, extremely important. This was the fourth point. And the fifth point, and the last one, is, is modesty. Teach, we should be taught modesty in front of the world. There are so many arrogant people in the world. And science is fundamentally modest, probably the most modest activity of, of, of uh, mankind. A scientist does not create, a, a, a musician creates a symphony, a poet uh, creates a poem, etc., etc. But science consists essentially in discovering what is uh, in, in nature. So this is a very modest activity. And uh, a scientist is not allowed to be arrogant. Sometimes he is or she is, but uh, then he betrays his uh, own discipline. As a conclusion, my, my concluding uh, sentence, I shall, I shall give it to a marvelous uh, woman, uh, a Chinese woman, who was at that time, she was a vice minister of education in China. Some of you know her, Wei Yu. Uh, and she came to France, this was in year 2000, I think, and she asked me to go in, in, in such a classroom, you know, and that was a nice classroom south of Paris and in a village. And the Children were looking at dissolution of salt in water. This is, one cannot imagine a simpler experiment. You put water, you turn the water, etc., or you heat, and the salt disappears. So where is the salt? This was a question. Some said the salt has disappeared. There is no more salt. Some said it is down under the table because they had seen the salt going in, etc., etc. Some said, no, I think it is in the water and not visible, etc. And you can imagine the... the, the, the they found the truth. The truth was that the salt was in the water, invisible. And when she came out, and this is my concluding sentence, she said to me, oh, I see what it is now. These children have made a little of science, dissolution. Yes, that's not bad. She's herself an engineer. So uh, they have 
learned something in science, but not, this is not the important thing. They have learned much more. They have learned making their imagi imagination work. Have you noticed, she said, she said to me, how these children speak freely? They were speaking, discussing team working in small tables. Team working, speaking freely. And then they were, um, they were manipulating, that is, touching the reality of the world, you see? And then she found herself the modesty. She told me, have you noticed this little boy who was a little arrogant? He thought he had the, the truth. That is, the threshold had disappeared. And finally, the truth, the, the reality showed that he was wrong. And not the teacher, not the minister, not the pope, not the, told the truth. The truth came from nature directly, you see. So uh, science is a big uh, uh, school for, for modesty. So she said to me, all these qualities, imagination, free, freely working, freely speaking, and stuff, this is she speaking now, not me. This is the way, uh, the path to democracy. This is why I want the Mahalapat in China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yves. Thank you very much. Uh, we have listened to the four very eloquent presentations from the speakers. That's, it must have been very interesting and uh, uh, very wise because I noticed not many people do so, uh, even though we had a very heavy, sumptuous lunch just now. As, uh, since uh, Professor Hassan elect to provide his comments at the end of the session, as I promise you, I would uh, invite a few questions from the floor before we break for tea, please. Maybe it's good for you to use a mic or run up. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the, uh, Mr. The gentlemen for the nice talk about cooperation between academies in the Islamic world and America and Europe. But my question is that can Islamic countries trust the West? Our experience in the last century and particularly in the last decade does not show, show shows that. The American occupation of Iraq have left a country that have the first civilization in the world completely destroyed. The Academy of Science that have 37 members now in Iraq, only seven. The institutes for research and the universities were completely destroyed. Most of the doctors, professors, uh, engineers, and so on, intellectuals, have either to leave Iraq or to be killed or tortured. And there, the American occupation who are supposed to safeguard those people according to the Geneva Convention. The problem of Iraq is well known to everybody. It's in the news and in the TV and so on. From, uh, second, uh, from the first war, world war till now, we witnessed the problem of Palestine and so many resolutions in the United States with the veto of America that stopped a resolution to solve the Palestinian problem. This shows that, can we really trust the West? My question so far does not show that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an observation, and you have also provided the answer, answers. Uh, all right, uh, go ahead. Uh, can I react very briefly on this? Because. Uh, the, the, the relation between uh, the, the Palestines and, and the, the Israeli uh, scientists uh, may be a good example of how science can be a measure to improve the situation. You know, there was this IPSO, which is the Israeli-Palestine cooperation, which was paid by uh, American funds, where you had twinning cooperation between Palestine and Israel scientists that worked beautifully. Uh, unfortunately, the, the um, funding of the project was, was only temporarily, so it stopped. But um, the European Academies, ALIA, has taken up this gauntlet and has uh, developed uh, in, in the same spirit an idea that um, whenever there is a conference organized by a European 
uh, academy or a set of Iberian academies, um, Palestine observers would be invited and that uh, teachers from uh, Europe would spend some time in uh, Palestine universities. So the, the, the idea is that uh, the trust between political leaders is, is, is very low. But the trust between scientists working together uh, can be very high. And I think this should be a building bridge uh, from bottom up and not from top down. And I think that is an example of some road towards the improvement of the situation, I hope. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I do appreciate the very uh, positive and distinctive contribution of the academies uh, and their representatives to our meeting. Indeed, it has been very beneficial to us. What I want to say is that in all uh, universal declarations uh, on science and technology, one standard clause is solidarity and international cooperation and sharing of benefits. Um, maybe I call to attention the UNESCO declarations on the, on the human genome, uh, especially when it comes to benefits for healthcare, human healthcare. The problem here that you know, we face is that the emerging uh, technologies, the medications, uh, the medical procedures from all these technologies, human genome, stem cell research, are exorbitant, are very expensive. So that, you know, how do you share benefits with developing countries, with uh, OIC countries uh, uh, that, uh, you know, are, are unable to afford the very high cost of these emerging medications and medical procedures. Of course, one way that, you know, I must ask the question, how could the academies uh, help bridge in, in this respect, and we've just heard the word bridging. Uh, one way that I could see is, is that to enable scientists in the developing world to be able to come up to the standards of the new research and the new technologies. Uh, so how could academies help in this respect? Thank All you. All right, thank you. Alice, I think you have a response there. I would, just, I would just like to say that I guess the thing that worries me about panels like ours is this idea that our Western academies speak to you, which is why I was hoping you would find the idea that uh, I discussed more interesting in the sense that it isn't about us helping you. You actually have the ASTF, the OIC, ICESCO. You have plenty of organizations, A, capable of doing things. They're all underfunded and they only can do tiny amounts of things the way they are. They don't have a strategic plan and there's no concept that exists. Now, is there a model in the world where no, they didn't wait for the West to do anything for them? China. I'll just use China though. And so the thing is you uh, have plenty of money in this region. You easily could pull together your scientific assets. And you have amongst yourselves the academies by themselves on top of which if you would work with the OIC, if OIC and ICESCO and, Twa and TWAS and uh, ASTF would actually work together, that's a big enough challenge instead of waiting for us to do anything. So I hope that you don't wait for us to do anything. I hope you actually pull yourselves together. Thank you. I have time for just two questions, Professor Atta Rahman and Professor Shamsil Ali. Well, thank you for excellent talks, all the members. I think we need to understand that the problem really lies within the Islamic world, as Alice has very rightly pointed out. We are not investing in science, and uh, we have leadership with closed visions. They don't understand that we live in a world where knowledge drives progress. And so in this closed, inward-looking world that we live in, where most of the leaders, whether they be kings or amirs or prime ministers or presidents, are mostly unfortunately corrupt, uh, we, we, there is little that we can do 
in terms of interaction with the academies because uh, on our side, you see, there has, the, the Western academies can only contribute if there is genuine receptivity. There is, of course, a desire on our side, but there is not enough investment taking place in science. And so it is the interactions are necessarily limited. So we need to put our house in order uh, and then uh, start working together so that we can move forward together. Thank you. Thank you. Shamsi? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think all the deliberations were of great value. But I just want to um, say something to the earlier president. Um, you said, what if there is a conflict between religion and science? We must understand the conflicts will arise if we don't understand the roles of each. The religion and science have their diff uh, separate roles and we have to respect the roles of each. But the thing is, we have to understand if religion is at all discouraging people to pursue, go for the pursuit of science. In Islam, there is one verse in the Quran which is exactly the agenda of science. That is Surah 10, verse 101, in which uh, Allah says to the Holy Prophet, Kulin Zuru, say, ask the people to pay attention to Ma Zafi Samawati Vyolar, between the, ask them to pay attention to everything that exists between the heaven and the sun. That is exactly the agenda of science, from the smallest to the, of the small, to the largest of the large. So just pay attention. So I think there is no conflict. Now what if something apparently runs into conflict? There is a, the, the, I can give you one example. The, we understand something as we go in uh, science. We, geoce you remember the geocentric and heliocentric. In Islam, it was nothing like that, because they say everything is in motion. Kullun fi falakin yasbahun. But uh, the, uh, uh, and there is also the creation in pairs. We had to wait for a long time till quantum mechanics in the 1920s, when Dirac says that the things are created in pairs. And uh, when you say pairs, it's not just biological pairs. Every particle, now we know every particle. So if you don't understand anything, you don't have to discard science. You have to wait, wait, and wait. And the, the thing is that we have to respect the roles. Now finally, the, you. the role of academies. I think no academy should really has, 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 has disagreed to issue any statement. For example, stem cell research, IAP, when it gave, we were all academies, I think, I don't know other academies, Bangladesh Academy, we said, of course, uh, except for the, 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 the intervention in the life process, we must go for stem cell research to understand the scientific progress. Geo, ge, ge, genome, yes, IAP itself, you remember, is correct. We, we ourselves could not come to a conclusion about genome, not to speak of other academies signing it. So I think there are roles to be played separately for religion and science. We have need these roles effectively, and every academy should emphasize that thank, we should thank you. let these roles uh, be in operation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, those are very wise words, which uh, President Majali and Director General Zobi may want to consider for the next uh, IAS conference, but the uh, time is not on our side. Uh, I want, I'd like to conclude this uh, segment of the session and please join me in thanking our illustrious speakers with the usual manner. Thank you very much. Uh, hang on, there's a presentation of the flight. Uh, Professor Hassan is going to make the intervention at the end of the session. We are just having an intermission for tea. Can I ask you, Professor Zachary, to present the IS shields to our eminent uh, academicians and representatives of academies of sciences. I'll call upon Professor Peter Drenth, please, to receive his token of appreciation from the IAS. Professor Michael Clegg, Foreign Secretary of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. 
Mr. Ellis Rubenstein, uh, the President and CEO of the New York Academy of Sciences. Thank you. And Professor Yves Curé of the French Academy of Sciences. We'll have a 15 minute break and then we resume for the Academy session, session again. Thank you.